when you love music and you love doing it, you know, it's not work. You can't wait to, to do it every day. So you got to be honest with yourself to think, is this really what I want to do every day? What makes me happy, you know? In 1993, there were no trailer music houses, so there, there wasn't a thing. And uh, we, when we started Immediate Music, it wasn't with the idea of starting a trailer music house. Uh, there was a very tiny trailer scoring scene in LA. There were like three or four guys who were doing this on a regular basis. And uh, Jeff and I uh, thought, you know, maybe we can, you know, get in on that scene of scoring trailers, not necessarily having, you know, a music library or anything like that. We didn't really know anything about that at the time. And so that's how we started. We were able to get into a trailer uh, editing houses and uh, we basically just went there and we kind of dropped off a reel. Everybody said, no, we don't need it until one, one company called us and said, hey, would you like to try, you know, writing music? I think the very first thing was, it was for the 1993 Academy Awards. So at that time, they used to do like a, a two and a half minute trailer that ran in theaters for all the best picture nominees. That was our first trailer score. There was a much smaller and tighter community, so once you did it for one, you kind of your name got around easier. And there were no music supervisors in those days, and uh, you know that's a very prominent role these days. But back then, we just walked into these places and kind of introduced ourselves to the editors. There weren't that many people who kind of even knew that that existed. Uh, so that's kind of how we we started getting into that. The studios approach a trailer as an advertisement. So if you just take it out of the context of the movie, you know, you've got to cut it in a certain way. You're trying to reach a certain demographic or age group to attract, you know, the audience. Similarly, with the music, uh, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be part of the movie. It just needs to work with the advertisement. And so we, we kind of learned that pretty early on. Fortunately for Jeff and I, we, our sensibilities were really directed at a cinematic sound. Uh, we love soundtracks. And it was a kind of, at that time, that was the style that they were looking for. So it was, it was great to be able to translate our passion for music into something that could work in a short two minute film, basically. So the, the genre kind of sprang out of that where these ad agencies were selling movies and they needed something that sounded like a movie. So oftentimes the music from the actual movie either wasn't appropriate for the advertisement for the movie and most of the time it wasn't even ready. It wasn't done by the time they started the campaign to promote the film. So uh, by, by tapping into that, and like I said at the time, it was really about that big sound, you know, uh, uh, I, a lot of times we, we were requested to do something that sounded like John Williams, you know, or something that sounded like Hans Zimmer, you know, some, some, something that lends weight to their movie, you know. Uh, and so that's how the whole thing kind of evolved as kind of an art form, because before that it was, what they used to do is, they used to take soundtracks from other movies, and put them in their trailers. Like at, in the 90s, uh, in the early 90s, uh, this, the soundtrack for The Mission was used in a lot of trailers, you know. Uh, a, it's a great score. B, it sounds cinematic. And C, people actually knew that. So it kind of drew, uh, subconsciously, it draws a, a viewer in and makes, makes them want to go see the movie. So that, that's kind of how we started uh, building it. And then obviously over time, you know, nothing stays the same uh, in the arts. And so there's different kind of approaches 
And like you said, it, it, it started going from this orchestral, you know, big cinematic epic orchestral, uh, and it followed the trends also in soundtracks as well, as it got more electronic and, you know, uh, hybrid. And, uh, you know, now, you know, with the sound design, and also it's kind of, these days I feel like it, there's a lot of sparse music, you know, that's kind of, a, that's film music now, you know. So, and that's kind of carried over in, into trailers. I think the thread through everything, though, is uh, emotion. So, uh, what you're trying to do with trailer music is to get the emotional content out off the screen and into the to the viewer to connect very quickly and effectively on an emotional level whatever the genre is you know it's not just trailers we we started getting placements obviously for a lot of the you know movies that maybe aren't in the theaters like some of the netflix stuff and all that i mean i think all together it's you know I, I don't count them up but i think maybe the last time i looked a few years ago when somebody asked that, I had to look it up. Uh, I think it was around 7,000 or so, you know, all together, different campaigns for movies, for TV, or for video games and all that, so right, right around that. I mean, the most challenging ones were always the ones that we were hired to score because it's, an, it's a process that evolves uh, collaboratively with a bunch of people so it, it sometimes obviously the trailer house is involved and the studio is involved sometimes the director of the movie itself is involved because depending how close they are to the you know to the process of promoting their movie you know they'll chime in as well so we've had a few uh, uh, jobs like that uh, the the, the, the couple that you mentioned, like Harry Potter and uh, the Spider-Man, those were actually placements that we had from music that we recorded, specifically with trailers in mind, to license out to the, to the studio. So it was pretty pain-free, <laughs> you know, uh, hassle-free. And like I said, some of the, the, the more challenging ones have always been the scores, but really not that challenging because it goes through a process of you know, you, you mock it up and then you send it in and then there's revisions, you know, uh, maybe there's, you know, at the most seven or eight revisions, et cetera, on the music part. But it really depends on your approach to it because you are serving the client, you know, and after your first pass on a, on a custom score for a trailer, it's theirs. So you really have to just work together, you know, not fight it, not be stubborn about, no, you know, you know, this flute line has to stay in there or, uh, you know, because it's their product and, you know, what, you know, it doesn't sound very artistic, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, they're selling a movie and you're part of that machinery. So uh, there is obviously opportunity to be creative, but at some point you also have to keep customer service in mind and you know you're, you're working towards a goal uh, a commercial goal so a marketing goal uh, so it's uh, that's why I don't really view it any anything as being challenging not to say that we didn't work hard I mean I one thing that comes to mind is uh, the one of the very first trailers we did this is going back about 25 or six years um, this was uh, the trailer for Carlito's Way, an Al Pacino movie. And uh, I specifically remember that Al Pacino was somehow involved in some of the creative feedback. And we did it with an orchestra in town here and all that. And uh, Jeff and I were up for 72 hours straight because it came in like at the last minute. We had to mock it up, then we had to send it in. There were a bunch of revisions, but you know, everybody had an opinion, so you get it you have to address all that and at the same time you have to hurry up and hire an orchestra and a, and a studio and copy you know the music so the players can play and all that it was it was a jumble and we, we ended up staying up 72 hours and uh, Jeff Jeff recalls uh, when we were driving back after we finished recording 
uh, we were driving back on the freeway coming back home and he, he was driving and he told, told me at some point I just went like this and hit my head on the dashboard because I was so zonked out, you know. Uh, but, you know, those are, it, it, it's fun, you know, to do it when you're in it, you're feeling the adrenaline and, and you're just going on, on that. Uh, so, yeah, it's all, it's all really good. I, I've, I've no, you know, I love the challenges as well. So that's why I don't remember them as being particularly, you know, straining. I can list a, a, a thousand influences, really. Uh, the, the one, you know, classical composer that I keep being amazed by is Bach, because uh, you could really apply things he did for, what is it, three or four hundred years ago now, uh, to a lot of contemporary music. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just astounding, as you, if you're able to go deep into it, to analyze and see, you know, huh, what did he do there, interesting, you know, and then you can, you, you can apply so much of that. Uh, so it's no wonder his music has lived on for, for, for centuries. Um, uh, my favorite soundtrack composer is probably Morricone. Um, you know, there's, there's many others, you know. Uh, uh, I really love, um, I, I think what Hans Zimmer's done with the sound of the modern soundtrack is very uh, influential on everybody, basically. Uh, and it, it kind of pushes the need to be equally adept at the final pro producing the final product. And we actu I actually worked with uh, his mixer, Alan Meyerson, uh, on a couple of projects, and that, that was great to do that. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, on the, and on the pop side, I'm a huge Beatles fan. And that's really had a, a, an effect on me, even in trailer music, because I really feel that trailer music, the structure of it is very effective when it's kind of crafted like a pop song. Uh, you know, in, in very specific A section, B section, you know, it's not, as opposed to more kind of symphonies that kind of meander for seven or eight minutes and then kind of touch on the theme in the ninth minute in a different way, you know. So it's, it's much more a quicker uh, exposition and a quicker delivery and a quicker reward on the, you know, on the, on the elements in the structure of the composition. So, yeah, just off the top of my head, you know, those three, uh, there's many, many more. The key to that, and I always say this, it, sometimes it takes me an hour to write a piece and then a week to produce it, uh, because you have to find ways to build, you know, a track based on uh, similar thematic material. So, um, and the thematic material can be very simple. It can be very simple, but you have to have the creativity and the knowledge of how to arrange it and how to build it. Because obviously trailer music, you know, most trailer music, I think still they want to have a build, you know, towards the end of the trailer. So you have to find ways to reiterate your musical motifs in compelling ways that are not boring because the picture has a dynamic that it's going for. The music equally has to. So you're right, it's a great point. You can't be repetitive in the sound of your output, but you, you have to be repetitive in, you can't introduce five different motifs in a two minute piece or in a one, one minute, sometimes it's 40 seconds, you know. So you have to find ways to lock in to an identity which is a musical motif of some, or whether it's sound design, whatever it is, and then present it in, com in a compelling, sometimes two or three or four different compelling ways to really uh, bring the excitement, you know, home, basically. Yeah, if a composer is, is really uh, dedicating him or herself to exclusively to trailer music, which I don't know if I'd recommend, uh, but uh, if they are, then I think the, the challenge is to, yes, of course you can get new sounds and plugins, but everybody's getting those, right? Everybody can get that. It's really thinking, when you're thinking about the writing and the creativity part, you have to think about the sound and the production. So a lot of times you need to really go outside your comfort zone and in terms of creating new sounds on your own, 
you know, or live uh, recording with different techniques, you know, running live uh, a player through some interesting effects processing, you know, it's just, it, you almost have to force yourself to do that because you need to stand out, you know, you need to be different in, you need to surprise, you know, because the, these supervisors and these editors, they've heard, they get inundated with, there's so much music. I mean, when, when we started out and for like 15 years after we started out, there was, nobody knew what trailer music was really. And so, you know, there was such a hunger in the end there was a supply and demand issue, which was the, the, the demand was here and the supply was here. Now it's completely opposite. Uh, so in order to stick out, it, you know, it's, it's a lot of it is ear candy, but it's a, a mixture of com composing and production style that, that really, so a composer really, if you're exclusively in trailer music, you have to invariably get really good at mixing and, you know, from an engineer's uh, perspective and production, like being a, not only a composer, but a producer, you have to have many hats on because the final product is, it's not just about the composition. Now, if you're a composer that uh, loves orchestral music and you want to get into trailers, uh, there still is room for that in trailers, just purely compositional uh, endeavors, right? Uh, I would say stick to that, do it. The more you do it, the better you're going to get. And the better, your identity is going to be that, which is not a bad thing to be known for one thing in such a fragmented marketplace and such intense competition, right? Uh, if, if a composer comes to me and says, I do everything, I can do everything, I'm already, you know, of course I'll listen, but I'm already kind of dismissive because nobody does everything great. Right. It's better to lock into one thing. So if there's an orchestral composer, you know, stick to that, really get good at that, hone your craft there, but also look for other opportunities apart from trailer music because it's not going to be enough to, you know, satisfy. Listening to music is huge and it doesn't matter what, if you're into punk rock or, you know, hip hop or, you know, 21st cent 20th century music, I mean, it's all specifically in trailers, it's all valid at some point, you know, so, and for your own growth as a composer as well, because it's, you know, it, it helps continually reshape who you are. And, you know, I've been around for a while, but I, you know, I look forward to these influences coming in and out and, you know, and, and taking shape in what I do as well. So it's, it's, it's not really satisfying to be uh, known as the guy who did the Spider-Man trailer, you know, 5,000 years ago, you know. So you, you, you have to serve yourself as, as a creator. And, and you're not, it's not just motivated, it's just a real love of music and recognizing that this is what your calling is. And, you know, you, you want to you wanna do it all the time and you want to get better even though you never really reach a point. I, I certainly don't. That I think, oh, I know it all. You know, it's, it's never that. It's always an exciting, every, every piece is an exciting journey because I don't want to be safe. I don't want to, you know, rehash what I, you know. You know, so instinctively, you know, if I go and I start composing something and it's the same, wait a minute, I already did that progression. I just throw it out, you know, I just, you, you got to move outside of that and challenge. The same way that I talked about in the production cycle, you have to try different things, different sounds, complete stuff you've never used before and integrate that into your process. When you love music and you love doing it, you know, it's not at work, you know, it's... Yeah, you can't wait to, to do it every day. So uh, it really, you got to be honest with yourself to think, is this really what I want to do every day? What makes me happy, you know? And like I said, even with the, the comp orchestral composer, if you find that one thing that you do, you know, go for it. In life in general, you know, Eventually, you settle on, you know, this is what I want to spend my time with. Because when we're younger, we're trying a lot of different things. And uh, as we get older, we value the time more than anything. We're, we're, we're not, we don't really value it when we're 18 or 22 or 28 even, you know. But as you get older, you value your time and you, you know what you want to spend your time on.
you know, uh, which is meaningful to you. The reason for uh, starting One Rev is that uh, a lot of times, you know, at that time, trailer music was big, 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 you know, everything big, you know, and uh, I, yeah, you know, that wasn't the only thing I wanted to try, you know, actually, Jeff and I, even before we started Immediate Music, I think we, we scored a TV show together, so uh, in the early, early, early days, so we we have that sensibility kind of built in uh, and not everything has to be bombastic and that was the reason we felt like everything in our library was kind of like big and we want to be able to do other things where you don't have to have 300 tracks you know it, it gets exhausting after a while so and, and it lets you explore stuff like pop and rock and you know minimalism and you know um, different different genres that would never have a home in trailer music if you're interested in doing you know hip-hop as well as you know go for it you know it's 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 great it's it's all it's all good it's all music that that motivates you gets makes you get up in the morning makes you have a, a lust for life you know and that's that's what the goal is because that leads to happiness and that's the most important thing for an, any individual to pursue